Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, first of all, I'll kind of let you know who I am with all these bars on my, my shoulder here. I'm the immediate past commander of Division 6 of the Coast Guard Observatory here, which is the division that, uh, that basically answers to Sector Houston, Galveston. This is not a real Coast Guard rank. I get this by being elected. Currently, I have made the, the horrible decision of accepting an appointment as legal officer for the district. So I'm going back to practicing law again. My background is 40 years as a maritime lawyer. And I'm proud to say that I'm a trustee of this museum and have been for many years. And uh, delighted to see it, it working forward. And we're uh, looking forward to bigger and better and wonderful things. So all of you be patient with this. Uh, tonight is uh, talking about the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is give you a kind of a overview of what the Coast Guard Auxiliary is. And we'll run through the history. Uh, there's a lot of history, but particularly during World War II, that I think is very fascinating. And then give you an idea of what we're up to and what we do. Uh, I really think that the auxiliary is one of those hidden uh, services. Uh, people don't know much about us, where we come from, what we do, except these guys running around in uniform. So I, I, I had to use some slides here. Here we just as an introduction. Uh, we'll talk about the role of the auxiliary as it involved. We're using a historical approach, and we'll do highlights from the founding in 1939 to the present. I could tell you that I'm here to dispel the popular impression that the Coast Guard Auxiliary is an organization of fat old men running around in motor boats, really had other boaters to slow down. That's really not the case. However, if you look at a couple pictures here, uh, you'd almost think that that is what the Coast Guard Auxiliary is all about. And typically that's who you see out on the water doing a patrol. There's a lot more to it than that. We'll consider uh, the auxiliary statutory defined role to discuss its founding and how it defended the country during World War II, the involving role during the, 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 the post-war years, and then spend a bit of time on what's been going on since 9-11. Uh, what is the Coast Guard Auxiliary? It's a unique organization. It is a uniformed civilian volunteer component of the United States Coast Guard. Each of those adjectives are important. We are uniform, we wear uniforms identical to the Coast Guard, except that my insignia is silver rather than gold. We are volunteer. We don't get paid, we work for free. And I'll talk a little bit about the number, huge number of man hours that are given to the United States and to the Coast Guard each year as a result of that. And we are a component. We are established by statute. Title 14, which is the title that, that governs the Coast Guard, as a part of the Coast Guard. We're different from other organizations like the, the Civil Air Patrol, which is tightly uh, uh, united, work closely with the Air Force, but is a nonprofit corporation. We're not a nonprofit corporation. We are a component of the Coast Guard, created by statute. The original uh, purpose was uh, recreational boating safety. But that has been expanding. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Under current law, the purpose of the auxiliary is to assist the Coast Guard in performing any Coast Guard function, power, duty, mission, or authorized operation authorized by law. And that includes virtually everything the Coast Guard does except law enforcement and security work. We are not armed. We are not allowed to be armed. We don't board. We don't give tickets. Uh, no law enforcement. But other than that, we can do, under the direction of the Coast Guard, virtually everything that they do. Uh, we have 26,000 members. There are approximately 40,000 active duty Coast Guard. So we're a substantial component of the Coast Guard. Uh, 825 local units. This is where it gets interesting. 3.8 million hours annually donated. We have 1,800 vessels and 160 aircraft. Here in this area, the sector, in the sector area for Division 6, we have 278 members in Division 6 and 10 flotillas that run from Lake Charles, uh, Port Arthur, Galveston, Freeport, Lake Conroe, and then several flotillas working out of sector <coughs> at Ellington or actually at the air station in Ellington. The contribution value 
for the Coast Guard was about $90 million. And the cost uh, of the, to run the auxiliary has been running between 15 and 18 million. We bring the value of our boats and aircraft, which are offered for use. These are our private private facilities. Uh, we we uh, uh, equip them, make them come up to Coast Guard standards, and the only thing we get in return, other than having a lot of fun, uh, is that we get reimbursed for our fuel and some of our lubricants and assets. And they do feed us, by the way. I think it's 365 per person for lunch these days. That's, that's what we get. So when I take guys out on my boat, that's supposed to be the allowable, but I feed them better than that. <laughs> Could you just a little bit farther away? Okay, I'm popping. Pop. Okay, I'm sorry. That's no, okay. Uh, early on a seems. Uh, the auxiliary relates to the notion of naval militias that grew up uh, really in the last century around the Civil War among yacht clubs, particularly in Boston and New York. Uh, the New York Yacht Club uh, donated a vessel uh, to the Navy during the Civil War. Um, the Royal Yachting, Yachting Associations in, in Great Britain have been working with the Royal Navy since the Napoleonic Wars. And during World War I, the Boston Yacht Club actually organized submarine watches and harbor patrols during World War II. Those were the precursors. There was nothing very much organized, uh, fairly probably in today's terminology, pretty elitist. These were yacht club people with big boats uh, uh, working with, with, the, with the Coast Guard and the Navy. In 1932, 34, excuse me, uh, A guy by the name of Malcolm Stewart Bowman, who turns out to be a screenwriter, was the commodore of the Pacific Writers Yacht, Yacht Club in Los Angeles. And he was, had been observing Coast Guard vessels uh, in the Los Angeles area and uh, kind of creating some relationships with the Coast Guard officers there. Wrote a letter to a lieutenant in the Coast Guard suggesting the formation of a Coast Guard reserve to play small craft at the disposal of the Coast Guard in emergencies. Uh, this is 1934. This idea bounced around for five years. And then a, a, an officer by the name of ultimately Admiral Commandant Russell Washi uh, picked up the idea and became really the father of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. To put this in perspective, that during this period, uh, this is when, you know, right after the 20s, in the 30s, although times were hard, uh, mass production was being transferred to making boats. This is when Chris Craft started just turning out tons of, uh, of uh, cruisers. And the Coast Guard was having a great deal of difficulty uh, handling that along with their other duties. And so the, the idea of a Coast Guard, what was called initially the Coast Guard Reserve, became very attractive. So in 1939, June 2-3, 23rd, 1939, the Coast Guard Reserve Act was signed into law, creating what is now the Coast Guard Auxiliary. By the end of 1940, uh, the Coast Guard Reserve, the Auxiliary, numbered 3,000 members and 2,700 boats. Back then, and it's actually still on the statute books, but back then, you had to be a boat owner to become a member of the Auxiliary. So it was fairly limited, and you had to go out and get your crew, and they weren't really part of the Auxiliary. And that changed during World War II. In 1941, before the war started, uh, both the Coast Guard and the Navy Department began to realize that the Coast Guard needed a military reserve organization. So the uh, original statute creating the Coast Guard Reserve, the Auxiliary, was amended to create the Auxiliary as a separate unit from the, from the reserves. And so there was a military reserve uh, subject to the uh, uh, code of military justice uh, under military discipline while the auxiliary remained purely a volunteer organization and, and then, so that's how we ultimately got our name before the war was, was declared uh, submarine warfare commenced in the Atlantic in July of 1941 the Coast Guard called for the enrollment of 270 auxiliary and other civilian vessels to assist with uh, uh, patrolling our coasts. 
we had an interesting situation and we were if you're familiar with World War II history, we were woefully unprepared for that war in many, many respects. In one respect was we had no shallow water coastal patrol craft. Uh, those that we did have, like the uh, World War I destroyers, which were actually too big, had been sold off to Great Britain, or leased the land waste program, Great Britain. So we were short of vessels and suddenly we had a huge problem with submarines off our coast. With Pearl Harbor, the involvement grew as it became more formalized, and literally thousands of people began to volunteer. Um, just to give you an idea of the threat of the, of the submarine, uh, sub German submarines in the early part of the war, uh, in by January of '41, this is just a month into the war, an average of 19 German submarines were working off our coast on a daily basis. In March. 70 ships were sunk along the coast. Um, and we were, as I said, extremely short of patrol vessels. In May, and this came as a shocker to me, the Germans began efforts to mine our harbor approaches. Uh, at the end of April, the Germans began shifting to the waters of Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. And during these early months, the auxiliary uh, was performing uh, search and rescue and uh, uh, security duty <coughs> along the coast. I threw this out because those of you who have seen uh, Dunkirk, uh, there's a real parallel here. Uh, we didn't have to go in and, and evacuate our troops, thank God. Um, but here's, here's what I consider one of the stars of Dunkirk, and it's the little boats. And that's precisely what ended up <coughs> happening here this is a photograph of the little boats in the United States. So those are Coast Guard auxiliary uh, vessels. And here's a Coast Guard vessel that was being operated by auxiliaries. And here are, and I'll explain this a little bit in more detail, these are CG, you can hardly see it, the CGR vessels. Uh, what happened was, uh, as things started to heat up, there was a need for armed patrol vessels offshore. Technically, the auxiliary was a civilian, non-military uh, operation, uh, but we had a lot of people who were willing to go out and, and serve. And so we, they, the Coast Guard introduced what they called the temporary reserve. And if you were an auxiliarist, I think you had to be between seven, 17 and 64. Uh, they couldn't get away with that upper age requirement now. Those old guys would want to go out. But, uh, uh, and uh, they would uh, basically uh, indu induct you into the Coast Guard Reserve on a temporary basis, typically with no pay. And it was hugely uh, um, uh, welcomed by the auxiliaries. And I've got some figures here, I think, in, in, in Boston. Uh, you know, they had a thousand auxiliaries, and of that, 700 <coughs> became temporary reservists going offshore. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how they armed the vessels and, and what have you. But I got a couple, couple fun stories uh, in the early days, and I always thought this was this was you know the, the fish story, but this is the auxiliary story uh, on one of, uh, on a search and rescue patrol off Fort Lauderdale. We had an auxiliary 38 foot cruiser came upon a German submarine whose diving fins had been damaged apparently. It was repetitively diving, surfacing, diving, and surfacing. Uh, the auxiliary vessel's job was to stand by with his radio, report position. And of course, as they're sitting there watching this go, go on, the guys on the boat started speculating as to how they were going to convince their, their buds back home that they actually were watching this German submarine do all this. And then suddenly, their boat was lifted out of the water. <laughs> That was a hor horrible crunching sound, and they found themselves sitting on the after deck of the German submarine. <laughs> that lasted about five minutes. It proceeded to go back to dive again. It, it broke the keel, but they had un undeniable paint markings on the bottom of their ship to prove, on the bottom of their boat to prove that they had encountered the German submarine. <laughs> You know, and this was also, I think, in the early part of the war, things were fairly polite. There's another great story out of Boston, is that we had an auxiliary vessel that came upon a submarine, German submarine on the surface, 
And of course, they were they're not armed. They were doing their thing of basically calling home, saying, we, look what we found. And the uh, German submarine captain came out on deck, and he said, in perfect English, what are you doing out there? You're going to get hurt. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> they did. <laughs> okay. Here's the temporary reserve. <coughs> Uh, and it was uh, it was created in the in 1942. It actually lasted <coughs> maybe 44. Uh, it was a stop gap measure. Uh, what we're talking about here, very much along the uh, the lines of the the Dunkirk thing. This was an emergency effort to get patrol boats out while the submarine situation existed. As new vessels were built. As more people were drafted or volunteered for the service, there was less and less need for these fat old men and others going out there and trying to defend the country. During this period, I think I've got a picture here if I can find it. Yeah, here's here's the. Uh, let's, let me talk about the uh, the uh, coastal picket force because what they did is they uh, decided to. Um, along with the temporary reserve to formalize the <coughs> utilization of the folks that, were, folks that were being volunteered by all these yachtsmen and boat owners. And so they created the Coastal Picket Force, which was integrated with the Army and the Navy uh, and became a patrol force of these uh, vessels were armed. So I understand what the deal was that if you had a suitable vessel, and you were a U.S. citizen and otherwise passed the requirements. Uh, you got three depth charges, a machine gun, and a radio. And you were sent off, typically along the 50, 50 fathom line, to hunt for German submarines. Uh, and here's some pictures. It's interesting also that they found that the most, probably the most valuable vessel to them in doing this kind of service were sailing vessels. And so in addition to everything else, these beautiful sailing vessels ended up with gray paint and a CGR number on their bows. The advantage is the sailing vessel could stay out for a very long period of time. These larger, larger vessels were able to handle fairly rough seas. They were quiet. The submarines couldn't hear them. And so you get a radio on there and you're watching for periscopes and what have you. Um, this is a great story and partially remarkable. We, we do know that uh, Ernest Hemingway and his uh, famous uh, fishing vessel, Pilar, was in Cuba and that he armed the vessel, or the vessel was armed for him, and he sailed in the, in the uh, Florida Straits hunting for German submarines. Uh, this is a picture of him on the Pilar. I tried to push the research on this, and it looks like that he wasn't really part of the auxiliary or the reserve, uh, but he had conned the, con talked the ambassador into loaning him some machine guns and what have you, and took off and was truly a privateer. But uh, I think <laughs> that's more, much more, more in fitting with him, I think. But uh, we like to claim him just the same. Okay. Uh, in addition to the. Um, Coastal Pickup Force, uh, we were had this huge amount of volunteers coming in, <coughs> huge need, and the need to relieve active duty people, young, younger people, to go and be deployed where they were needed all, uh, uh, around the world. So in addition to the Coastal Picket Force, we had port security. This is a photograph of a couple guys uh, checking, uh, it looks like a battery to me, but uh, it was interesting, the responsibilities of the port security that was largely delegated in some areas to the Coast Guard Auxiliary, included, and I'll just kind of read this off because it's really kind of, kind of interesting how much was needed to be done. Controlling harbor entrance, vessel movements, anchorages, fire prevention, supervision of lading and story of ammunition, expo and explosive sealing ships radios, security measure they had to carry out, guarding piers, warehouses, dock ships, harbor areas, issuance and checking of identification cards for access to some sensitive areas and enforcing to regulations pertaining to the use of cameras and binoculars. And any of you who are familiar with uh, current security concerns now uh, probably know that if you show up at the wrong place in the Port of Houston with a camera, 
Uh, somebody will ask you what you're doing. It's, th th those are still operable concerns. Uh, my, my research indicated that uh, the sole responsibility for war security was taken over in the first, I think, first and fourth districts. Down here in Galveston, we know that we had reserve, uh, temporary reserve slash auxiliarist manning fireboats. Uh, this was a huge problem. Uh, I think what was the name of the vessel? I want to say the Normandy. Huge fire uh, in uh, New York Harbor. And it was discovered and it, and it was carrying ammunition. Things got out of control. The, the vessel sank. It was going to be a troop transport. Uh, and became they, the Coast Guard became aware that they really didn't have enough firefighting uh, capability. And so the RT got involved in that. The last thing that during the war that was important is beach patrols. The auxiliary didn't do as much beach patrolling as in the other areas. That was largely active duty. These guys were armed. This is a, this is a photograph of a mounted patrol in California. Uh, they got the horses from the army. Uh, they were putting a helmet on, but otherwise dressed like sailors and uh, armed, obviously. And I know that uh, at least in the Florida Panhandle area, we had several auxiliary units that were doing mounted patrols during the war, uh, and occasionally catching people. Well, sadly, the largest thing that, that, that happened is during the, the high, day, high days of the, of the sub submarine warfare is collecting bodies on the beaches. Um, this is when women really became involved with the auxiliary, particularly in the port security area. You know, this was a day where women were given administrative tasks or what have you. But there were so many administrative checking IDs with paperwork involved. And so that, that became a growing area. And the auxiliary has always, as, as the Coast Guard uh, has been, open to the involvement of women. And uh, we're seeing that more and more. And it's not unusual these days. You go out and your ship is being inspected by a Lieutenant <coughs> JG who is a, a, a young lady uh, fresh out of the, uh, the academy. And it's, I would, as, a, as a father of daughters, it's a cool thing to watch. <laughs> and they don't take anything off anybody. <laughs> In addition to all of this, auxiliaries were involved during the war uh, with medical units actually equipped uh, two or three uh, medical ships, hospital ships. They trained dogs. They did watch standing duties. They did logistic supports. Uh, and the uh, and so far, war bonds. And a, a few units actually had marching bands. Uh, about this time, and I get out of this photograph because it's, it's, it's not from the war, but about this time, uh, in 1944, uh, the air side of the auxiliary was established. And uh, these guys, again, their own airplanes, meeting Coast Guard standards, flying patrols uh, along the coast. And we've always, we've always had this in any service, I think, certainly the Navy is the same, is we have this back and forth between the surface guys and the air guys. And uh, I, I smile at this photograph because the uh, surface guys frequently think that that's what the air guys are doing is land their, their amphibian airplane on a beach and lay around. But that's not what they do. Excuse me, I keep getting this thing too close to me. Uh, let's see if I can move this on now. Here we go. Uh, <clears throat> during the war, 50,000 auxiliaries and temporary reservists served. Uh, they were almost, the number is almost interchangeable because they were moving back and forth and auxiliaries could be working 30 days or 10 days or three days as a temporary reservist. Uh, no one died from enemy action, but we had 137 deaths in active service uh, out of the 50,000. Uh, all the kind of things that you would think about slipping and falling on ships and falling into void spaces and what have you. But as typical with a aging demographic, uh, we had a lot of heart attacks and illnesses. But uh, by and large, I think that was a pretty good ratio um, to make it through. Okay. The estimate is, and this, I think this is important for all of you to know, and the estimate is that um, the service of these 50,000 people freed up 8,250 active duty Coast Guard Coast Guardsmen to serve in the various theaters during the war. 
and, uh, and that was, I think, very significant. And if any of you have looked at the Coast Guard's activities and role during World War II, uh, it came as a surprise to me that many, if not most, of the landing craft in D-Day, uh, the coxswain was a, was, a, was a Coast Guardman. Uh, they were working off of LSTs that were all Coast Guard and a huge contribution to the war effort. I'm not as familiar with the Pacific side, but it's, uh, we were, by, by taking people who are willing to serve, who can't meet the, necessarily the medic, medical, physical, or age requirements, uh, they can augment and they can multiply, they're a force multiplier, and that's very much what the Coast Guard Auxiliary really is all about. Okay, post-war years. As with everybody, I'm going to talk about this. The Coast Guard Auxiliary shrunk down to about 13,000 people. I wanted to mention this. Uh, it's, it's important, and there's, there's, a, there's an auxiliary component to, to this, but something that uh, many of us forget. I, I was with the law firm that represented one of the ships that blew up in Texas City. And the Texas City disaster colored the goings on in this port, Galveston, Houston, this area, uh, until very recently is kind of slipping out of memory. But these were ships that were uh, carrying ammonia nitrate originally, uh, the explosives going to be using as used to be used as fertilizer. Uh, fire started as one of the ships down in Texas City. Uh, it was probably as close to the United States to an atomic explosion. Um, over 600 people were killed. Um, um, sadly, the volunteer fire department, the fire department of Texas City, was vaporized. They never found it. You know, just, it was unbelievable, uh, uh, horrible. Uh, and I think the 531 number is low. But this is a photograph, just to give you an idea of the extent. Expanse, and you see as far all, all the way to the horizon. What's significant, uh, digging around, I found the uh, Coast Guard Board of Inquiry. And over on page 37, I'll not read this out to you completely, but uh, in the afternoon of the first day, uh, Coast Guard had mobilized everything they had. The auxiliary showed up from Houston with their boats. And then auxiliary from Galveston went over to the Lackland Station and filled out the uh, the rest of the uh, crew for the Coast Guard boats working out of there. Uh, that uh, the, the Texas City disaster, I don't know if we've ever done a program here on that, but it would be worth worth going into. I mean, I, I just could give you, on the legal side of background, for many years I served as the management counsel to the uh, all the fringe benefit funds for the longshoremen in, in this area, from Lake Charles all the way down to Brownsville. The old timers, and they weren't that old at that point, uh, insisted that we maintain uh, amount of money equal to the cost of medical care for people, for, for the long term, and for one year, just in case another Texas City disaster occurred and we'd have enough money to cover their care. And uh, sadly, because of the change in law and what have you, we learned that it was technically illegal for us to be accumulating that money. We had to, we had to get rid of it. We put it to a good use because uh, the cost of medical care went up so quickly that it, it seemed to disappear overnight. Uh, a huge event that we can spend some more time on. The 60s and 70s, I want to roll through these things pretty quickly. Uh, uh, Auxiliary has a growing recreational boating safety role. Um, a lot of public relations during this war, this period, and I see if I can find my notes here. And, uh, there's a number of people that I had look, looking at my my demographic cross section out here, uh, all being a little bit close to my age. Um, all sorts of, of uh, no, notables were involved in supporting the auxiliary in the 50s and 60s. Uh, people like Arthur Godfrey, uh, Walter Cronkite, Lloyd Bridges, and what is it, Sea Watch, that famous, which actually did a great deal to publicize the existence of the auxiliary. And Walter Cronkite, 
And um, most of all those guys became honorary commodores and what have you. Uh, In 1967, we moved to the Department of Transportation. Uh, Coast Guard did. Uh, not, not a huge move. And then we had the Voting Act of 1971. Get too many papers out here. But in 67, uh, well, let's just let's go back to 1970. In 1970, uh, we were up to approximately 9 million recreational vessels, and this was a huge problem for the Coast Guard. Uh, in 1967, uh, a study of recreational boating safety was conducted and essentially indicated that the situation was out of control. And statistically, and this is interesting, boating was the most dangerous mode of transportation in the United States. In response, Federal Boat Building Safety Act authorized the Coast Guard to impose safety regulations for the manufacture of boats and boating equipment. The boating number system was turned over, had already been implemented, it was turned over to the states, and there the state's regulatory role was increased. The Coast Guard was given authority to intervene in cases of unsafe use. It's interesting, up until this point, the Coast Guard had law enforcement authority but limited, they did not have authority to go and stop a vessel that was being operated dangerously. And finally, they got that authority. Uh, we saw more and more uh, authorization of local law enforcement. And for the auxiliary, um, we were allowed to patrol sole state waters as long as there was a memorandum of understanding with the state. And this has become significant. For instance, in this area, uh, if any of you go up to Lake Conroe, which is uh, heavily used by recreational boaters. We have a strong uh, auxiliary presence there that works hand in hand with the local constables and the and the river authority uh, instead of working as closely with the uh, with the Coast Guard uh, to basically police that lake. And they've had some uh, very interesting experiences. <coughs> they were they're the people who get called out when the when the lake is too full and they say we're not going to put any boats out there. They're the guys that have to try to keep people from going out there. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been very interesting. This is a period of budget cuts. This is a, a continual theme. And, uh, and as a result, more and more search and rescue uh, obligations were put on the, uh, the auxiliary. Uh, we don't re really remember that vividly, at least I don't. The 1974, remember? No gasoline, prices went up, but the bigger problem was there simply wasn't gas to be had. And uh, it just took a tremendous hit on recreational boating. Um, 1975, one of the things the auxiliary has always has done since actually the 50s uh, is on courtesy vessel safety inspection. The program was expanded to include uh, making sure that the vessels made state regulations as well as, as federal regulations. And any of you who have boats and are no people who do, I encourage you to do that. What, what, what that is, it's a purely volunteer, voluntary inspection. Uh, no consequences if you don't pass, but what we do is we run through at least the minimal safety equipment that you've got to have on board. If you pass, and we'll give you a chance to get it fixed, put a sticker on the side, and chances are the, the nasty guys from uh, the game wardens will not stop you or are less likely to stop you. Uh, to check to check your safety equipment, which is uh, happens frequently down in the, the Kima Seabrook area. Okay, by this time the auxiliary was back up again to about forty thousand, and um, another program was was uh, was introduced for the auxiliary. Since the Coast Guard was now regulating safety requirements for vessels and equipment, uh, the auxiliary was asked to introduce what was referred to as the Marine Dealer Visitation Program. Uh, so we have auxiliaries who are specially trained, and we continue this to this day. It's really has grown and is very useful uh, to visit on a regular basis boat dealers, anybody who's, who's dealing with, with boating equipment, uh, keep them up to date on recalls, requirements, regulations, 
being able to post uh, notices for uh, voting safety courses, and just in general be a resource to them uh, and a contact for, for the Coast Guard and for the auxiliary. And I think it's really enhanced voting safety because we've got, uh, we're helping them help their customers be safe. If there's any, any huge, one huge problem that we see on the recreational boating side here in this country is that we're one of the few countries that do not require uh, a boat operator to take a course and become, become licensed. Except the state is now changing that. If you're 24 or younger, you have to have taken a boating safety course. But in Europe, much, much of the rest of the world, uh, that the Western world anyway, uh, you're, you're expected to be licensed. Uh, insurance requirements are severe, and you end up knowing what you're doing. Uh, the problem in this country is if you've got enough money, you can go down and buy a boat and roll out with your trailer that afternoon and have absolutely no idea what you're doing. And we run into people driving on the wrong side of the channel, doing absolutely all sorts of crazy things, and scares us to death. And it's an educational problem. Uh, the, the drinking on board, is, and that's actually a problem that is getting, getting improved because law enforcement has really stepped up. But it's a real concern. And it's, uh, we are free Americans, and we're not going to have to license our boats. And if uh, you don't believe that, uh, check with, uh, with the U.S. boat people, and they will, they will come out of the woodwork on that. <laughs> uh, another aside, I talked about Texas City. I wanted to mention the Blackthorn. Um, not, not an auxiliary vessel, but in uh, January 28, 1980. Uh, the Coast Guard buoy tender Blackthorn, which was home ported in Galveston, it's kind of close, near and dear to us, was sunk in a collision in Tampa. It, it uh, caught, was caught by the anchor fluke of a passing tanker. It flipped over, and 23 lives were lost. That's the Blackthorn. These are, you know, probably built in the in the 40s, uh, and uh, something that we remember that. This was probably the largest loss of life the Coast Guard experienced outside of warfare, uh, wartime experiences. Uh, and two lessons learned there. That, uh, going to sea is dangerous, although this was actually an important when it happened. And just to look at that vessel, what we're looking at, and this is where I have to, have to tell you, I'm here in a Coast Guard uniform, but I do have some opinions that are not necessarily official of the Coast Guard, and bear with me. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the difficult things that we run into is, particularly the Coast Guard, is underfunded. Its budget gets cut regularly. And we've got ships like this, this one sadly is, is gone, that are 50 years old, 60 years old, still being run. And we're just actually literally having to wire them together. Uh, big experience for the auxiliary and for the Coast Guard was the Mariel boat lift. And we're all old enough to remember that. This is, there are many, many pictures. But as you recall, Castro decided to open the prisons and then anybody else who wanted to leave. And it was this, this huge movement of vessels to Cuba to bring family back, to bring whoever. Uh, the Coast Guard had to just simply move all of their assets in the southeastern part of the United States to the, to the Florida Straits to handle this influx. And so, again, what the Coast Guard Auxiliary does we, we are a force multiplier and backfiller. So we stepped in and took over uh, the search and rescue responsibilities for South Florida while all this was going on, which ended up in the auxiliary putting in about 25,000 hours conducting 400 reports and 75 SAR cases. And that's really what our role has, has been so often. Uh, <laughs> won't bore you with the recitation I could go through when you look at the, the histories that, are, that have been published uh, of what, what we refer as picket duty. That is basically uh, vessels patrolling the perimeters of regattas, maritime events, and parades to keep people out of the area they're not supposed to be in, helping people if they get in trouble. Uh, the auxiliary has always been involved with this. Beginning with the space shuttle in 1981, we operated uh, off Cape Canaveral, uh, basically operating a, a picket zone, a, a security zone. Uh, we worked the America's Cups races at numerous places. Most interesting thing is uh, things you can pick up in the corners of doing your research. 
Uh, remember the uh, search for Red October. Uh, the Red October, the, the vessel in the movie was actually a mock-up that floated. And they would take it out regularly out, to, out of Los Angeles Harbor, uh, offshore, to, to do the filming. And it was the auxiliary that handled the escort duty for the Red October. Wow. I'm, not sure we, I'm not sure we got any credit for that. <laughs> Huge development happened about this time that has affected the auxiliary and the Coast Guard. Uh, what I refer to as the great towing controversy. We have this growth in recreational vessels, uh, and up until the mid 80s, the boating public literally assumed that if they got into trouble, you ran out of gas, whatever it was, either the Coast Guard or the auxiliary would tow you in. No questions asked for free. Uh, about this time, there was a growth in an industry of uh, of towers and solid wars who found that not just commercial but uh, we move in the recreational towing area uh, we can make some money they started pushing on their congressman and the word came down that uh, particularly the auxiliary uh, was encroaching on their livelihoods and we had to stop doing what we were doing now bear in mind for a lot of guys who love boating that's really what the auxiliary was all about all our vessels are fitted to tow other vessels and to pull people out of the water. And we practice that. Uh, and so this is probably one of the most uh, stringent qualification areas that we have. Guys live for that. All of a sudden, we can't do that anymore. We finally worked out a compromise. And you can imagine, the public was angry at us because we'd have to say, no, we can't take you down. If we did take, take somebody and tow them in, the commercial towers were angry at us for cutting them out of a job. So it was sort of a no-win situation. We worked out a compromise, and this is, continues to this day, um, and that is that the auxiliary and the Coast Guard will respond to a situation of immediate distress requiring immediate response. In other words, if somebody is in peril, we will tow. Uh, if they're not in distress, we will call it a commercial tower if they want us to, call a friend, send out a marine broadcast to see if Good Samaritans will come and help them out. And then, and only then, if no one comes, we'll take them in tow, but only take them to a safe safe haven. In other words, not back home, but to a safe dock and let them go. Uh, this pin up here on me is, uh, indicates that I'm a boat coxswain, so I, I go out and I have to make these decisions and I tell you, there, it's very difficult. You're out there with people who are in distress, need help, and, and frequently people who can't afford it. Now, I have several rules. It's pretty clear somebody can't afford to be towed in and they're in real trouble. We're not going to let them stay there all night. Uh, but we have to make these fine decisions as to whether this is a real distress situation or not. We call back the sector because when we're out there, we're in constant contact with the sector uh, and uh, with their with control center and get permission to do that. Uh, it's been a bummer. It really has. Uh, and occasionally we have we have to rein in our people who want to go out and help. They're there to help. And somebody gets in trouble and then we get yelled at because we didn't wait long enough. But this is a typical these are this is what we do now. These are auxiliary people telling auxiliary people. <laughs> and we're practicing, we're ready. And we frequently have to get in and, and move pretty quickly, and we're, and we're ready to do that. Uh, the 90s, uh, this was the, the era of the environment. Uh, here locally, we had the Chinooza still in, in the Bay, which actually I was involved with. It uh, dumped a huge amount of uh, diesel oil in the Bay, caused all sorts of problems. And of course, we had the Exxon Valdez in 1990. Uh, leading to the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which just added another function or enhanced another function of the Coast Guard, and that is the environmental function. Uh, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 gave Coast Guard a lot more responsibility and, and uh, a lot more authority. About this time also, we were going through a redefinition of the Coast Guard's role. <coughs> 
and I, I think I've, I've given you the language before, but instead of limiting the auxiliary, or as we, I think we had four different functions, but clearly the functions were primarily recreational building safety. That was what we existed for. Uh, in the mid 90s, it was 96. The statute was changed so that we were authorized to do anything the Coast Guard wanted us to do, save law enforcement and security work. And that has just simply opened up all sorts of new avenues for the auxiliary. Um, and, uh, and we still have the recreational boating function as primary because within the Coast Guard, we're, we're primarily responsible for recreational boating safety, uh, but we're also doing all sorts of other things. And that's what I'll lead into now. As we get into the turn of the century, Okay, uh, another thing that changed, 9-11. So we've got the environmental developments in the 90s. 9-11 changed everything. Um, in terms of auxiliary involvement in 9-11, uh, as you would imagine, in, uh, in New York Harbor and in all the harbors, things were up for grabs. Uh, particularly in New York, the auxiliary ended up being Basically, they now have ferries in New York carrying people around. we have been to New York recently. That's what the auxiliary did. It was moving personnel uh, wherever it was needed and heavily involved with that. Uh, as a result of the reorganizations that took place after 9-11, the Coast Guard was transferred to the Department of Homeland Security. And then the whole emphasis on port security came about. We had a statute dealing with port security, vessels have to have security plans. We now have security zones where it used to be, in the, in the good old days, we would do harbor patrols and go up into the turning basin and make sure everything was okay and there was no oil, no oil in the water. Uh, post 9-11, given the security, the terrorist concerns, um, the Coast Guard doesn't allow uh, auxiliary up. They want armed, uh, active duty Coast Guard vessels in the area. So that's an area that we've had to move away from. And if you're, and if you're a, a recreational boater, you know that uh, there are areas where, let's say if you go in, you will be met by a 29-footer, one of those bright orange jobbies with a big machine gun on the front end, and people ask you very politely exactly why do you think you're here, and telling you maybe you need to turn around. Uh, we introduced uh, Waterways Washing. We were part of that. This has been a... A, a really a, a, an effort by Coast Guard and all, all the other authorities. And this is literally um, to keep your eyes open when you're on the water. And if you see, see something unusual, to report it. And um, I'll tell you a real quick funny story about that. Um, this all started, uh, the Seafarers Center uh, gives out boxes, Christmas boxes to seafarers to come into the port during Christmas. Coast Guard gets a call that there is a man out on the dock dressed in black with a black bag that he's trying to throw on a ship. And they scrambled three, three little boats to go out and find out that it was Father Rivers for two delivering the Christmas bag. <laughs> uh, in our lives, uh, one of the developments was heightened uh, background checks for the, for the auxiliary. Uh, it used to be in the good old days, you could just join the auxiliary, you were a citizen, a uh, resident alien, you're in. Uh, now we have to go with what, what, what I refer to as a PSI, personal security investigation. But everybody that goes into the auxiliary now has to have at least a minimal security background. And if you really want to do some of the fun things, you have to get what is called a, a direct operations clearance, which is, like they tell me, just a tad below secret. And if you, in the Coast Guard is in a position that if they want to use you doing something a little bit more sophisticated or sensitive than that, um, they, can, they can bump up your security clearance. <coughs> With the additional requirements, responsibilities uh, on the gold side for, and I say gold side, but referring to the fact that they're, they're uh, in gold buttons and we're in, in, in silver, uh, they're Again, not, not having gotten any real additional funding, but having both security and environmental pollution response um, 
we're doing more, more and more backfilling for them. Um, just mentioned the, the Shuttle Columbia disaster, uh, which uh, was close to home here, first of all, because of the Johnson Space Center. And many of us, our auxiliaries, are either active or retired NASA people. I've got uh, a couple people in my, my flotilla that are, uh, have uh, worked at Mission Control, you know, and um, all, all sorts of interesting backgrounds. Um, the auxiliary surface side, the boats did not really get involved in this because this all happened in East Texas. Um, but we basically mobilized our air fleet and all sorts of interesting stories. Again, ferrying people around, uh, bringing investigators to some of the smaller East Texas towns, getting personnel in and out uh, in that, that sad event. The next big thing that happened, I'm going to kind of run through current history and then we'll give you some questions. Uh, Katrina. Uh, what did we do there? We all know what happened to Katrina. This is where the Coast Guard Auxiliary really got involved in incident command post support, or command center support. Uh, again, our, our role as being supporters, backfillers, uh, force multipliers, uh, both in Mobile and New Orleans, they stood up and for literally for months uh, helped uh, uh, with uh, managing the response. The other thing that happened, some of our guys here were some of the first fixed aircraft, fixed wing aircraft to get into New Orleans. And then again, they ended up doing logistics and personnel movement. Uh, moved very quickly. Of course, we all know Ike. Uh, all the boats that got torn up. Again, uh, we were we stepped in and did uh, incident command post support. We were we were there, uh, filling in, um, handling, you know, basically managing and providing support in terms of. When, when the command center sets up, sets up, you have all sorts of things, uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous. So you've got operations people who are out there trying to get things done. We don't necessarily get involved in that, although we do occasionally. But things like making sure people get fed, making sure the documentation is handled so the records are kept straight, working with personnel, uh, <laughs> the, uh, intake, checking security, make sure people are entitled to come into the, into the uh, secure area. Uh, and then more and more we've been getting involved in uh, administrative things like, such as uh, finance, public affairs, that sort of thing. Deepwater Horizon, we quickly go through this, another horrible thing. Uh, and the involvement there, the interesting thing here, more, more uh, uh, ICP support, but this was the first time in recent memory uh, that the offer went out to the auxiliary that if you could break loose for 30 days, uh, we need to. And we had a lot of auxiliaries that simply were embedded with Coast Guard. This was a virtually all hands in the nation type response. Uh, spending 30-day uh, periods over in the New Orleans or Mobile area, uh, working with the Coast Guard on all sorts of different levels. This is one I enjoyed it though. Remember this when we got, we didn't get the real shuttle, we got the, the mock-up. Uh, and this is a picture of it coming in. And there's a, I guess it's an auxiliary boat over here. I could not find a picture of my boat. There's another auxiliary boat way over here. <coughs> but I drew that, I had, got a, a, had a fairly large boat and I drew the job of being the blocking boat to keep all the recreational boaters away from the barge. So I was the stern of the barge, separated from it by two DPS, uh, only thing I can call them were gunboats. These are big black, 40-foot, high-powered runabouts with six machine guns on them. And every time somebody tried to pass me, I just sort of moved over a little bit and pointed up to these guys. And it was amazing. The recreational boats just fell back and would hang themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another picture. Uh, the, other, the other thing that was interesting there is we were to follow that up all the way to where they transferred it ashore. And uh, about two-thirds of the way through, uh, Clearly, um, the founder was registering zero, and the barge kept going, and Kirby was doing the pushing. You see the Kirby. Yeah. So I asked him. I said, "How did you do it? Like, there's not enough water for me to get there, and I'm, I'm relatively shallow." I said, "We weren't floating. We were. It was a sled." Wow. <laughs> and it's not true. Um, this is something that we're 
we're proud of and we've been going, I think we're in sixth year now. Uh, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, along with the Port of Houston, the Houston Pilots, and San Jacinto College, sponsor a Maritime Youth Expo. I think it's Maritime and Logistics Youth Expo every year. Uh, and we do it out of San Jack here recently. We've done it at the Cruise Terminal when we could. Uh, we bring in floating assets. Uh, we bring in uh, employers from the Air Maritime employers. And what we're doing is bringing in students that are interested in a maritime career, high school students primarily. Uh, one of the interesting developments in this area is many of the high schools now have a maritime program. And so uh, what we're doing is these kids need to see, number one, they need to see the toys so they can start imagining what they might be doing. Uh, the exposed people are actually doing, these are good jobs. Some of them only require high schools, some of them obviously are college or graduate school. There's all sorts of levels and we're seeing a generational uh, turnover. So what we do is we come and the auxiliary is in charge of basically maintaining order and safety. As one person told me, we're, we're the control uh, 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 in charge of control of the, of the students. Here we're, we put them on a, a boat and make sure they put light jackets on. Maybe the first time they put a light jacket on and make sure they have an idea of how to safely maneuver around a, a boat. Uh, here's your, yours truly over here. Somebody's asking me about flying. Well, occasionally I do, but I'm not a flyer. I'm actually a service guy. Uh, this is uh, just a little bit of a plug for uh, uh, auxiliary aviation. And what we've been doing the last few years is the, the Coast Guard has been having our aviation people go over to the Air Training Center in Mobile, where they train the Coast Guard pilots and take them in for a week. And they are treated as if they're Coast Guard. They're to meet Coast Guard requirements. Our airplanes have to meet Coast Guard requirements. And so we basically taking the standards up very high and also standardizing what we're doing so that we mesh easily with the outside, with the with the goal side with the with the active duty so that we can do search and rescue uh, primarily but a lot of logistics work. This particular airplane here is a Cessna citation. This is the flagship. It's not actually very good for search and rescue uh, but the Admiral seems to like it to be flown around to various events. And the other thing that we just used for just recently, I think uh, we had a uh, Coast Guard person that became ill in New Orleans, needed an emergency, um, emergency procedure that was available in St. Louis, and these guys flew over, picked up the person, flew them there, and again, Coast Guard pays for the fuel, we do address. Uh, Texas City Y was probably the, the last big, big collision that, uh, that we were involved with uh, down there right where the barges and the ships come together. Uh, and what was significant here uh, is the use of the beach assessment teams. Uh, we did the incident command post again. This is going to become a regular for us. We step in as soon as there's an emergency and we can bring in kind of a nucleus of people to hold the operation together. And bear in mind, these command centers, you're talking maybe 100 people and there are all sorts of functions, frequently administrative, that we can step in and do. We don't have to take a leadership position. We understand that that's something that the active duty will do. But we have a lot of background, a lot of experience, and uh, sage advice occasion. But one of the things that I thought was, was uh, uh, really significant, Captain Penoyer, who was our, our captain of port at this point, there had been a big spill over in San Francisco, and all of the and the wild the persons worried about the wildlife, the birds, the sea otters, and what have you, offered their services, and they were turned down because no one knew how to handle that, that level of volunteering. And so what we do now is we have teams uh, that uh, are volunteers, uh, and auxiliaries to assign to each team. The team will be probably five or six people. Uh, the auxiliaries will have a radio. Uh, We'll take down information. We literally walk the beach hunting for distressed birds, dead birds, oil on the beach, anything that we can run into, uh, and report that back so that the remediation teams can come down and take care of it. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a 
a hugely uh, deft move from a public affairs point of view because um, we're all volunteers. We understand the urge to volunteer when there's a, a disaster or a problem. And you just simply don't turn people away. And now we found a, a, a vehicle so we're in oil stills. Hopefully we don't have many in the future, but if we do, we've got a way to give people a meaningful way to uh, contribute. Virtual boat station. Uh, two years ago, this is my old boat here, uh, the captain of the port asked us to take over the search and rescue responsibility during the summers, during the weekends, uh, in mid-bay, basically, out of, out of Clear Lake. Uh, the reason for that is we have two boat stations who are charged with search and rescue uh, in ordinary times, uh, active duty stations, one in Houston, up at the Turning Basin, the other down in Galveston. The transit time for, for those boats to get up to respond to the stress situation in Midway is at least an hour. Uh, we can station a boat and we have a boat station starting, try to schedule it around heavy, heavy activity time, so um, early afternoon until dark. Uh, we can be on scene in about 30 minutes. We're in radio contact with the Coast Guard. Uh, we're trained to handle uh, helicopter hoist operation, so we've got somebody who's hurt, we can we can coordinate with the, with the helicopter. Uh, another thing that's going on is the university program. Uh, the Coast Guard does not have the ROTC. Uh, they've started programs at various uh, colleges and universities around the country. Uh, through the auxiliary, we have a unit attachment in uh, the, the Texas Maritime Academy, uh, Texas A&M Galveston, uh, where we've established an auxiliary detachment that is attached to one of our flotillas and coordinates with the station down in Galveston. And uh, these young people uh, start working on their qualifications. Uh, they're interested in the Coast Guard, they're interested in maritime careers generally because they're in a maritime school, uh, but some of them are interested in careers in the, in the Coast Guard. And we've had uh, some of our graduates just in the last year uh, already been commissioned through OCS. We've got others that have gone into the enlisted ranks. And this is really a cool program that uh, will help the Coast Guard build uh, for the future. Uh, annual redfish, just a real quick here. Uh, this is something the auxiliary does um, with the, with the uh, active duty. We have been concerned about mass casualty scenarios, both aircraft and uh, uh, cruise ships. Uh, kind of grew out of uh, conversations with one of the chiefs down in, uh, the, actually the, uh, the the head of the boat station in Galveston, who said, I got a call from the airport saying we've got a 747's got engine trouble and they're considering ditching in Galveston Bay. Can you help? <laughs> uh, and I said, yeah. Uh, we need to start working on this. The active duty needed to work on it, and we needed to work on it. So what we've been doing the last few years is having a joint exercise using our air facilities, the uh, the helos out of the uh, air station, Houston, surface craft from from both of the boat stations, and uh, up to six or seven auxiliary craft going out and doing a simulated search. And this last time we actually set up with with the uh, uh, active duty at Sector a command center that would be handling this scenario. And so we're gaming and doing tabletop at the sector level, doing real in the water activities here. Direct cost, Coast Guard support, we'll probably run a little bit over here, but just to give you an idea of what we're doing now, now that they've opened the world up to us. We've got guys that are doing watch standing, which basically is manning the radio stations, uh, keeping in contact with the vessels, uh, Coast Guard vessels that are out and out. Uh, we've got a couple guys that are actually doing uh, marine casualty investigations, um, taking a great deal of uh, work off the, uh, off the uh, active duty. More and more we're being asked to do uh, vessel inspections. The Coast Guard's responsibilities for uh, towing vessels uh, has been added on to uh, small passenger vessels and that sort of thing. And so we're moving into the inspection area. We've got a person or two that is working with, with the goal side. Uh, and planning. We have some translators. It's a real, don't think about this, but uh, uh, the Coast Guard doesn't have a big staff of translators. 
Um, we have Vietnamese shrimpers here in Houston, but the world shipping speaks any number of languages, and occasionally you need to somebody who speaks that language. And we so food service, uh, one of the, the ways the Coast Guard has been hurt the most with the cutbacks and funding is in food service. And we are actively so, uh, soliciting volunteers, training people to be food service specialists to work at galleys. We have one guy who actually works as the chef on board the Dauntless and gets to go out on Caribbean cruises for a couple of weeks on the Coast Guard as long as he'll cook for them. Uh, we have people, if you go out to the sector, you uh, probably half the time will run into a auxiliarist to check you in. We do data entry, we're doing incident management, administrative, doing teams, um, and all sorts of other things like this. Let me talk about Hurricane Harvey, because this is, and I'll end with this, because this is, brings us virtually up to date. Um, we had 73 uh, auxiliarists involved in the response. We were primarily uh, involved with the incident management administrative team. Basically, we were, we were there at the command center. For the first two or three days, it was about 50% auxiliary and 50% active duty uh, before they could actually start getting people in. So we were really, you know, part of the backbone. And the distinctions between active duty and auxiliary started to slip, slip away. Uh, one of the things that happened, and I don't know if there was much publicity about it, but the 911 system in Houston, Harris County, got overwhelmed. The television stations gave out the Coast Guard stations a number and we suddenly were in the 911 business. And so we were running a 911 answering service, and this was excruciating work. Because early on, to give you an idea of how close things were, we had one working helicopter. Uh, we didn't have any John boats. It was waiting for the, for the Cajun Navy to come over. Uh, and we were having to triage what kind of distress are you in. If you're only in three feet of water, but otherwise OK, we'll get you eventually. If you've got a, uh, a pacemaker, you've got uh, dialysis, you've got a situation like that, we're going to get somebody to you right away. The people's having to sit and make those kind of decisions working through. Uh, air operations, uh, we brought in uh, a lot of our aviators who did not fly. They basically uh, handled the air control operations uh, along with the old side at Elliott. We went from one helicopter to 40-some Coast Guard helicopters and over, over 100 helicopters generally. Food service, we started running out of food. We didn't have enough food, we had too many people to feed. Uh, a lot of people who didn't have any food service training got to be food services people right away. And then one of the things we were delighted with, things were stretched, and we were, were asked to do uh, surveys or assessments of the waterways early on, so I, for instance, uh, I and another coxswain took our boats. We were the first to, to survey, or really assess, we didn't do a survey, we assessed environmental conditions on the ICW from High Island to Freeport. Uh, we also went out and started looking at the condition of the marinas, sunken vessels, and what have you like that. And crazy little things like we needed automobiles. There were lots of automobiles belonging to the government in uh, Dallas. In San Antonio, somebody got to drive them down. We tapped into the Luxorus in those two cities and they drove them over. We put them up for the night and sent them back. Here's one of our guys, a real great story here. We didn't know quite what to do with Rusty, uh, and the uh, public affairs people were desperately needing some help. So he was, as the Brits would say, seconded to, um, to uh, public affairs and um, basically. Uh, stayed the entire time. Uh, here's what we were desperately needed punts. We didn't have those. These guys came in from Paducah, Duke, Kentucky. Uh, here's some of the helicopters run through this. I, I particularly like this picture for two reasons. One, I'm in it. <laughs> this, this is the incident command center. And this is uh, the commodore, uh, I mean the commandant, and the commander of the Ace District. Uh, and I, I, I like it because I'm in it. But these two guys here, myself and Joe Leonard, who is a retired uh, Coast Guard commander but is now in the auxiliary, it sort of exemplifies our role. All the activity was on the other side of this picture. This is the people they were talking to. It was the active duty people that had really made this happen. 
but we're down there in the background where the support people. And I thought that the, the, the spacing of the placement of people in this picture kind of caught what we were what we were doing. Uh, I talked to you about old vessels. We're going to lose the Nautilus. She's leaving. Uh, she's uh, she was built in 1967. We need some money. That's what's going on in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Wow. Thank you. Questions?